started this series with a word of optimism, a word of confidence. But God has given us a promise as individuals and even as a nation that this year we begin our year of harvest and enlargement. And I made it known to you, all of us, that this is a promise you must believe and a promise you must take for your life. And at this bountifulness and this enlargement can only come from the Lord. Because if you look at everything on a terrestrial plane, Regardless of the country you go to, you will see all kinds of stresses. But this promises is from the celestial heavens. And I made it known to us that the first thing we need to do is to understand the time of our visitation. Now the second thing that brings you to your time of visitation it's when God has taken you through the processes of training, the processes of testing, the processes of God dealing with you. And you do not fight the Lord, and you openly and you are patient for the Lord to deal with you properly, then you will see into the period of triumph. But today we are going to be looking at if you are going to get an abundant blessing, you must free yourself from quarreling and strife. You must free yourself from quarreling and strife. Now, look at exactly what happened to Joseph, I mean to Abraham. There was this strife. I can, I can tell you, you see, pro, the, the greatest strife you can ever face in this life is the family strife. Because your family is always with you, is it not? The quarrel is always with you. The nagging is always with you. The shouting is always with you. Your family or those around you have your history. They have the memory of your life. And they keep on repeating it and repeating it and repeating it. You did this, you did this, you did this, you did this, you do that again. You can never stop doing it. And in many cases, they are blank-sided to your positive goods. And so family conflict, and when I mean family, both nuclear and extended, is one of the biggest source of quarreling. The, if you are going to be really a person of abundance, the first thing is that you must, God helping you, make a policy, a ground rule for your relational skill. As I wrote here, set relational guidelines and rules. If I'm going to be happy and joyful, and really get a harvest, I must set relational rules. How I relate to my spouse, how I relate to my parents, how I relate to other people around me. If you don't set those guidelines, if you don't set those rules, you may not even live long enough to get those harvests. And if you are stressed, you can't even do anything positive. You can't study. You can't pray. You can't look healthy. Everything around you will be tensed around. And when you start having tension around you, it becomes a habit. Make it an ambition. Make it a goal to lead a quiet life. You see, let me tell you, one reason why people have problems is that you go and look for informations. Now you carry all these things to your mind. 
It's not your business. Some of them you get in cell phone. It's not your business. Your brain is not patterned to collect information from everybody except you are going to solve them. And there's nothing you will hear in your brain that your brain won't keep thinking about. And so study to be quiet. The job God has given you is big enough. I'm a pastor and I can be worried about people's desires, but I do it at a certain level. I don't keep carrying everything on my head. And if you don't do, have this good relational principle, you will be sick and you may even die. Free yourself from grudges or bitterness. You see, this is exactly what Abraham did. It's very difficult in a family setup. I know what I'm saying. Because family, you are always annoying each other. But you must make it a policy that the sun must not go down on your anger. That you must not bottle up bitterness. Because if you bottle up bitterness, everybody gets spoiled in the family. And so if you are going to make a policy for your recreational things, you must say to the Lord, I do not want to hold grudge. Scripture warns us that we should never hold grudge among God's people. Then the third thing I say, make a rule against gossips. Then the fourth thing you need to do, as if you are going to have a good relational skill, is that you must avoid arguments, murmuring, and strife. And I, I, I studied myself, and I found out that why do we really grumble? Why do we really strive? Do you know where strife comes from? Pride. Proverbs 13.10 tells us, only by pride commit contention. But with the well advised is wisdom. Only by pride comes contention. But with the well advised is what? Wisdom. Thank you so much. You could be seated. Thank you very much. I want to wish you all of you a happy new year for those who have not seen for this year. And really make you realize that it's going to be a very wonderful year for every one of us. And it's going to be a year of bountiful harvest and enlargement. I started this series on bountiful harvest and enlargement on the 31st of December stroke first and then on the last Sunday I continued and this Sunday will continue we are taking as our study Abraham encounter with his nephew Loth and also with the Lord come over here in prayer Father we thank you for your mercies and your grace Pray that your word would fill us with mighty presence. And your word will heal our bodies, our spirit, and our soul. And Lord, I will be blessed beyond doubt. Help us, my Father. In Jesus' name we pray. I'm reading from Genesis chapter 13, the Message Bible. So Abraham left Egypt and went out to the Negev, he and his wife, and everything he owned, and Lord still with him. But now Abraham was very rich, loaded with cattle and silver and gold. 
He moved on from the Negev, camping along the way to Bethel, the place he had first set up his tent between Bethel and I, and built his first altar, Abraham prayed there to God. Lot, who was traveling with Abraham, was also rich in sheep and cattle and tents. But the land couldn't support both of them. They had too many possessions. They couldn't both live there. Quarrels broke out between Abraham's shepherds and Lot's shepherds. The Canaanites and the Perizzites were also living on the land at the time. Abraham said to Lot, let's not have fighting between us, between your shepherds and my shepherds. After all, we are a family. Look around, isn't there plenty of land out there? Let's separate. If you go left, I will go right. If you go right, I will go left. Lord looked. He saw the whole plain of the Jordan spread out, well watered. This was before God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Like God's garden, like Egypt, and stretching all the way to Zohar, Lord took the whole plain of the Jordan. Lord set out to the east. That's how they came to part company, uncle and nephew. Abraham settled in Canaan. Lord settled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent near Sodom. The people of Sodom were evil, fragrant sinners against God. And Lord separated from him, God said, after Lord separated from him, sorry, God said to Abraham, open your eyes. Look around. Look north, south, east, and west. Everything you see, the whole land spread out before you. I will give to you and your children forever. I will make your descendants like dust. Counting your descendants will be as impossible as counting the dust of the earth. So on your feet, get moving. Walk through the country is length and breadth. I'm giving it all to you. Abraham moved his tent. He went and settled by the oaks of Mambre in Hebron. There he built an altar to God. This is going to be a very fairly long series, uh, not too long series, but a lot of riches are going to come out of it. Abraham was a man of promise. Theologians call Abraham's covenant the Abrahamic covenant. That God called Abraham from the awe of the Chaldeans and he wanted to build him Canaan. And then he promised Abraham, just as you cannot count the stars, so your children shall not be counted. A lot of us know that the children of Abraham include the Egyptians, the Arab country, and also Israel, who happened to Jews, happened to be the top in almost all the realms in this world. And so this man was a man of promise, a covenant. And just as Abrahamic covenant was, so we also have a covenant from the Lord Jesus, in which Jesus has given us the covenant of relational relationship with the Father. So we are joined head with Christ. And everything Christ has, we possess in the realm of this world, in the realm of the heavenlies, and in the realm 
of the demonic world. And that's why we say we have bountiful harvest. Whenever God has a covenant with you, whenever God has a promise for you, expect the enemy to fight back. Paul said we are not fighting against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Indirectly, we're saying we are fighting against the world system under the dominion of the power of darkness. And the enemy will use all kinds of things to get you out of the covenant of promise. God promised you a good home. The enemy will do everything to strike it out. God promised to take you to greater height in your walk. The enemy will do everything to make it bad. And one of the greatest weapons the enemy is going to use is the weapon of strife. The weapon of strife. And as I told you about, strife begins in the family. And in fact, it holds in the family 90% of strife. And Abraham faced this strife. The emotional drain, the deep emotional drain you have when your family is always in contention. The way you carry that contention to your workplace, carry that contention to your place of worship, you will never make a progress compared to your peers. And when prosperity begins to come, and space is needed, expansion is needed, there comes strife. Look at the House of the Apostles. When the Bible started expanding the people of God, then there was rumbling and grumbling. But Abraham knew that this strife between himself and his nephew was a distraction. For those of you in big time management, I tell you this. When your subordinates are coming to report to you about what is going on, go right to your boss. Don't listen to your subordinates. Don't entertain small talks and small rumors from people. Go straight to the boss. And when the strife was going on and there was all difficulty, Abraham took the initiative. My brother, we don't need to have quarrel. Take anything you want. Anything you want. You go left, I go right, go right, I go left. You want everything. And he took everything. He took everything. And after that, God spoke to him. We'll talk about that in details. Why do I think that Abraham behaved that way? Because Abraham has a covenant of peace. The Bible says that I will lead the people on the way of peace. I will lead them in the way of peace. Peace is a supernatural presence of the Father. Peace puts you in a state of stability. People with peace sleep well. People with sleep hardly have emotional tantrums. People with peace, there's something cool and collected about them. People with peace are very organized. When you see a person who has peace goes to his house, everything is in the right place. Because peace inside is expressed by peace outside. And Jesus made us to know that you and I are children of peace. He said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And so if you are going to be successful and a bountiful harvest, you must carry your peace to everywhere you go. Take your peace to the bank. Take your peace to the marketplace. Take your peace to the schools. Take your peace to your church. That you become a symbolism of peace. So much is peace so important that Isaiah said of Jesus that is the prince 
of peace. Can you see, somebody described the husband some time ago, that my husband is a man of peace. How is someone can describe me, the wives and children, as people of peace? Now, I think you know, on a deeper sense of it, a deeper sense of it I want you to know is that Abraham realized that Strive is deeply rooted in self-promotion, in contention, in competition that actually destroys productivity. Now, I'm going to read a scripture which some of you may have read, and I will read for sake of time just a few verses of it. I read from Philippians chapter 2, I read from the Passion Bible. It says, walk together with one harmonious purpose. You see, when you look at life, you ask, Why, what is the purpose of my coming to this job? We are academicians together. What is the purpose? We want to write papers to do well and advance. It's not whether you are better than me or not, I'm better than you. Well, we are at home. We want to build our house, we want to settle down, we want our children to be well brought up. It's not important whether uh, my husband has this and I must have that. The moment you take rivalry to your home, your home sinks. The home is one. One person's fame is the other person's fame. By the time you hear somebody saying, you are always succeeding, I am not succeeding, that home has a crack. And the more they keep mentioning that, the home collapses. Many homes have collapsed long before there's a physical marriage. Now, physical divorce. It says, walk together with harmonious peoples and, with, and you will fill your heart with unbounded joy. And I'm going to explain to you deeper. Be free from pride-filled opinions. For they will only harm your cherished unity. Don't allow self-promotion to hide in your hearts. But in authentic humility, put others first and view others as more important than yourselves. Abandon every display of selfishness. Possess a greater concern for what other for for what for what others yeah, possess a greater concern for others instead of your own interest. Now, strife begins from inside us. Our mindset, our imaginations, our thoughts. You see, one thing that shocked me about the Bible, when I was reading about Lucifer, the prince, morning star, glorious man, he said, that was such a magnificent beauty until iniquity was found in you. So strife doesn't start with the quarrel you have with your husband, but inside you, prideful thoughts, my own concern. This person is doing better than me. This person is selfish. This person is planning against me. And now when those things come, Paul said you should take authority. You should retain, taking authority will give you serenity and will preserve your sanity. Because the moment you are not content and have a self-esteem in yourself, you will always see everybody as obstructing you. And so what you need to do, first of all, is to bring every thought, every imagination, and every high thing, and bring it subject to the obedience of Christ. What is the obedience of Christ? Jesus never considered it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. And he humbled himself even further to die upon the cross. And because he did that, God had highly exalted him. That at the name of Jesus, 
every knee shall bow. And so you find out this. And I can tell you I see this so commonly and I pray I'm, I get there soon. Humility attracts God so much that when God wants to prepare a great saint, I was speaking a meeting of 4,000 pastors and more just last week from all over the world. And I made them to realize that humility attracts God as pride repels God. And so if God is going to use you greatly and you have self-promotion and you have contention and competition, you would actually have what you want, but you lose what you need, which is God. James says, humble yourself under the mighty hands of God, and he will lift you up, or even Peter that said that, when the seasons are done. God knows you need to be the best in your field. God knows you need to have a good life. God knows you need to travel around the world. God knows you need to do many great things in life. But he say, humble yourself. One of the greatest books I've read in management was a book by, called by a man called Jim Collins. I saw read that book several times that it almost become like a Bible to me. And that title of that book was From Good to Great. In that book, the man did a study of all the good companies that later became great. You know, somebody said that the enemy of the great is the good, and the enemy of the best is the better. And when he extracted all the great companies, that great who has higher productivity and output, he said there was something he noticed about the leaders, that they were humble people. That when the company is successful, the great CEO, we said, look outside. All these cars and all the people made it. And when the company is failing, they will look at the mirror. You see, one bad thing about academics, so not, most things in academics are good, but quite a lot are very bad, is this idea, I must be the first author. I must be the first author. And so because of that, there's a lot of strife, a lot of competition, secrecy, Two people in the same department, even attending the same church, are secret to their research. Nobody wants to share his view because I must be the first author. I must be the first one to publish that article. But as good as that may help in academia, I don't know if how much it helps, but it has no place in Christ. It has no place in Christ. And with time, if you're an academician, you know what makes you great. If I want the joy I have in being an academician, that there are many of my colleagues around the world who, because I stooped to allow them shine, are ready to do anything for me. And so humility becomes it. It's not my own. Where is my own? Oh, I'm in church now. When will I have my church? Oh, my husband has bought a car. Where will I have my car? You know, you have bought a new shoe. What of my own shoe? Actually, Jesus was telling us that when you deflate the light or the prosperity from you to others, it variably comes to you. And that is it. Moreover, strife is not good because you are a covenant of a higher promise. Everything that this and in this world ends in the terrestrial world. But Jesus is head in the celestial, is head in the terrestrial, and is head under the earth. What does it mean if today you are already succeeded? And then suddenly you have a breast cancer, or suddenly you have a, a tumor, and in three years you are gone. What is the use? And because God has kept you, uh, that even when you die on this side, you have a place in heaven, so you are going to behave like the children of God. The rules and regulations of heaven is not on this earth. I can show you a scripture that shows that. And I'm going to read from you from Luke chapter 6. 
This is a scripture you should read every time. Now, Luke 6, I want to read verse 35. Now, there's several things in that Luke 6. But verse 35 says, but love your enemies. That is not the world. Fight your enemies. Shout on your enemies. Shun your enemies. And do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. You know what? Every Christmas, I send out gifts to all my family members and extended family that I know are alive. Apart from the orphans and so on. And usually at the end of that Christmas, or that end of the year, I'm almost flat financially. You imagine somebody sending maybe half a bag of rice, sometimes a full bag of rice, money to everyone. And many of the people I do things to I haven't been the best friends of mine. But Christians do not add out of preferences, we add out of principles. We are not driven by the way people react to us, we are proactive. We are not governed by the relations people do to us, we are governed by how God relates to us. And it is when you distribute grace that you attract grace. Grace is a dynamic blessing from God that is not supposed to be static. So when you give it out, you receive it. You hold it, it loses its value. But love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great. And ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. You know, sometimes people want to give you gifts. Well, has he given you? What has he given to me? Oh, you want to go to somebody's program? What has he, has he come to my program? Actually, Jesus said, if you give to those who give to you, then your reward is already done. You've just reciprocated. So, that is a higher principle. And those of us in Christ, we owe it our duty to represent Christ by our behavior. Jesus, Paul said that we should be harmless and blameless in a perverted world wherein we shine as light. So there's some distinctiveness. There's some contrast. Not by the dresses we wear, but by the character we exhibit. Jesus said to them, I send you out. If a Christian has a shop, people should know this is a Christian. His courtesy, his gentleness, his mannerism, his caring for those customers, he's going the extra mile. People should really know he's a Christian. If a Christian is a teacher in school, there's no reason why your students should fail their exams. So when you come to your board meeting and start saying they fail, they cannot read, that isn't the Christian spirit. The Christian spirit is that you want to make sure that any candidate that comes to you as a student has the best they can ever have. Show them how you succeed. I was talking to my teenagers, I said, look, if I go back to school now, I'll make distinction in all these subjects, especially the science subject. I said, do you know why? Because I know science is a matter of principles. It's not a rote learning. And I can spend hours learning the principles than just cramming the things. But you need a good teacher who can quietly take the students through principles, allow them to derive the other things. If you come to a Christian shop, he's not going to tell you lies. He's going to tell you, look, this is a product, although it is good, but it's not the best. Just go right there, you get the best. Oh, I, I cook this meal, I'm trying. But you can't compare my meal to the, past, the other person. That in fact, I learned the recipe from him. Wow. Now, when you think that that is going to diminish you, actually, that is going to enlarge you. It is a misnomer.
For any Christian to think that the money he has is his own. Our money is a universal thing given to God for us for judicial distribution. And so we must, as Christians, avoid strife, not only because it destroys us, but it destroys the confident relationship we have with God. Proverbs 17.1 says, Better is a dry muscle and quietness thereon than a house full of sacrifices with strife. Proverbs 17, 14 says, the beginning of strife is as when water is let out. Therefore, leave off contention before it be meddled with it. Immediately you sense that making this statement to your friend, to your spouse, is going to cause trouble. Just leave it. Just leave it. Especially when you know that leaving it will give you peace and will pertain to the relationship. Somebody was asking me a question. I said, how best to develop harmony in the home? I said, listen, if your husband is used to behave in a particular manner for the past 10 years, why do you have to keep on repeating what you know is there? Actually, I met a man who was in his 80s, going to his 80s. And he told me that the greatest regret is, I mean, he's divorced, that he was advised not to marry his wife. And his children has had children. He's had all kinds of people. I said, that's foolish. And almost every man I met, every woman I said, somebody told me I shouldn't marry you. The person who told you, is he having a good home? Is he very successful? Put a good man in a bad situation, and he turns a bad situation into a good situation. Put a bad man in a good situation, he turns a good situation into a worse situation. As orange, when squeezed, you get the juice. So good men, when you squeeze them, the goodness in them comes out. Everyone's behavior is tested in the arena of conflict. That's how we know the messes are made. That's how the Maradonas are made. That's how the generals are made. It's in the, it's in the arena of conflict. And so if you say you are a good Christian, the only way I can know you are a good Christian is in a conflict situation. God doesn't prepare a table in the presence of our friends. He prepares a table in the presence of what? Our enemies. There is no way a good man can be known except in the surroundings of evil. And there's no way light can be appreciated unless in the thickest darkness. And so you find that, that you have to make a policy, a principle, because you are a man of covenant, that as you move through this year, you must be slow to speak, slow to wrath, and quick to listen. In the first service, I talked to a man called William the Silent. I think it was the Netherlands, one of those people. And all over the world, William the Silent was due to be a very great man. Some historians, I was a student of history. I was a very student of history. I used to make high marks in history. And they said to him that this man, Williams, he's very diplomatic. They call him one of the most diplomatic persons in the world. But when people, people were analyzing William, they said one thing about William was that William was always silent. And that actually, the enemies of Williams feared him because of his silence. I gave an example some time ago. There's a group of people called in, in Lagos. I don't know what they call them. Those who stop vehicles here and there. In fact, they are more keen and looking for vehicles who make mistakes than those who do well. What do they call them? Last mile or something. I remember when last mile, whatsoever they call, caught, told us, my driver took a place and he was defending himself that he took the right place. I lost my control. I had a program to go one hour's time. And the last man said, took off the steering for us, and last man was taking us to maybe where we'll have to pay a lot of money. I kept quiet throughout. I didn't say anything. Then the man stopped. He said, the way he looked at me, he was he's afraid of me. He said, I'm afraid of you. He said, I don't, I'm afraid, please. 
I didn't say anything. Although I was praying in the spirit, and maybe he was experiencing some spiritual waves. The Bible says, even a fool, when he keeps quiet, is called perceptive. That is for you to speak perceptive. Sometimes you go to some families, go to some homes. The husband says, put this in here. The wife says, put it here. The husband says, let us fry a No, I say, let us boil it. You come to their house and say, please, I want you to make a door that is wood. No, no, he say, make it with plastic. <laughs> Wisdom will tell you, if your husband or your wife is talking, you keep quiet. There has to be only one voice. Then after you finish, say, darling, preface it with darling, sweetie, or honey. Or if you like, you can say, oh, amala. I mean, I don't know why we should be, <laughs> I don't know how we should always be using honey. Don't you think that, or, or what, don't you say, don't you think you're abusing him? You say, maybe, what if, if we consider it? Or just whisper to him in the ear, or write a note. What of this? So the man or human, woman's ego will be great. So avoid those times. Second Timothy 24 says, and the servant of God must not strive. Quarrel. Quarrelsome. But be gentle unto all men. One scripture says, courteous to everyone. You cannot do that until you stop promoting yourself. You cannot do that until you stop contention, controversies. And then you will sleep well. Now we have had, uh, we have, um, I can confess this thing because it's always good that for pastors to be human beings, not supernatural human beings. We've had all this um, early in the morning prayer meeting for how many years, two years now. I have never slept extra. I wake up weary and around. Yes, last week we went to church. To, I went to speak in a very big meeting, and I went to go and see the other This is, and I took, I went to visit them. So I slept, and the sleep was very sweet. And at three o'clock, the Lord woke me up for prayers. So I went up, I knelt down, I finished praying. Usually, when He wakes me up like that, I will still have to ask, should I continue right or this? I said, Lord, I finished this prayer. I want to go and sleep more. And lo and behold, I slept. And the sleep was also very sweet. And lo and behold, when I woke up, the time was 6.41. I couldn't believe my eyes. First time in two or three years, I have not started a meeting with them. But it was good. If I were fighting and quarreling, I would have been regretting. But it was good. God knew I needed my body needed rest. So what am I trying to illustrate? Self-promotion isn't helpful. And then, as I gradually come to the latter part, he realized that for you to succeed, you must separate yourself from people. Now, when I give this message some time ago, I say, Pastor, are you saying husband and wife should separate? If my wife is a problem, no, no, I'm not talking of a marriage situation. In a marriage situation, you stay patient. If at all situation you stay present. But no matter how good my marriage is or your marriage is, you must not allow your wife to make you to flaunt principles of God. You must not allow your husband to take you to hell. And the cure is not by divorcing. But by in your spirit, looking for spiritual ways, not by talking, talking, and advising. Counseling in the home is one of the, the worst craft anybody can get. Because when you open Ephesians 5, the man says, wife, respect. The man, woman will open her own. Husband, love. So when it comes to marriage, home, people are two preachers. So just love them. But I'm talking on a general principle. Don't be friend. Don't be too familiar with someone who's aim is contention. Whose aim is not strongly aligned with the values you go for. Now, Proverbs 22, 24, and 25. Do not make friends with a hot-tempered person, 
Do not associate with one easily angered. Why? Oh, you will, may learn his ways and entangle yourself with a snare. You know, I find that people sometimes talk to you to provoke you to speak. They ask your opinion. They anger you. And nowadays, I'm learning to just be quiet. If I cannot edify, the Bible says, let everything be done unto what? Edification. If I'm going to say something, I'm going to build you, and you kept on talking to me, listen, my dear friend, the way you behave is not good. I said, thank you for that great advice. I'll think about it. He's provoking you to talk. And in the multiple of wars, wanted what? Not sin. Paul advised the Roman church, now I beseech you, brethren, Mark them which cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. Turn away from them. I don't believe in gossip. This church, we don't believe in gossip. Trafficking information from one person to the other, I don't believe in it. As soon as somebody comes to me and starts telling me about evil about people, about my first pastor, by my father, about my mother, about my friends, I will quickly cut that discussion off. A lot of people recently are so obsessed with Harry's book, Spare. The man is rich. The man is happy. The man has a lot. Some of us don't have a second shoe. Not even talking of one. We are debating spare. Don't put your mind on things that doesn't concern you. You will see revelations. You will see visions. And you say the vision you put there in your brain. Release yourself from all kinds of, all kinds of things that are too much. Free your mind. Somebody said, before the cell phone come, will we not exist? In? Before the computer come, will we not exist? In? Some ladies I know, some of you in nature, you put on lipstick, a new lipstick, you go there, say, watch me, my lips are, are lipstable. What is that? Nobody's going to give you money for that. You make one hair, you say, look at my hair. I say, because I have it, I flout it. Hmm? Your marriage is not going to come from the social media. Well, if you are in the social media business, by which you have advertised your words, all right, do that, but do everything with discretion. Philippians tells us, Philippians 3, For as I have told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. He said, I'm coming to find out that 90% of what people say, even Christians, has no basis in scriptures. They are their opinions. 90% of the advice people give has no, they are is smart as far as the world is concerned. But it's not scriptural. It's not reading on scriptures. And Paul said, I'm, what people you are looking, hanging around you, they are enemies of Christ. And he says, they are destruct, their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach, stomach infrastructure. And their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. The now says in verse 20, but our French, our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Heaven is where your blessings come. Above is where your blessings come. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord, you see, Abraham knew that it is the Lord. Proverbs told us about the Lord, and it says all that, that it is not in man. Uh, let me read that scripture out. It is not in man to get any victory. It says, he will protect his faithful ones, but the wicked will disappear in darkness. No one will succeed by strength alone. Everything comes from God. So the time you spend contending, quarreling, why not kneel down to God? Why not tell God, meet my needs? 
if your family doesn't have enough, why do you have to wait for your husband? Why not tell God, supply my need? If your parents are not giving you, what the Bible says, if my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will what? Take me up. Let your mindset be with God. Deuteronomy 8, 18 says, remember the Lord your God. He is the one who gives you power. I don't want to use the wealth to be successful. Because there are wealthy people who are not successful. New Living Translation. And so I, I give you as a simple principle. Separate yourself from those who will not direct your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. Be friend with them, but don't be too friendly. Separate yourself from those who will defile your conscience and make everything look as if it doesn't matter. It matters. Separate yourself for those who will not sustain the doctrine you have received that is embedded on the cross of Christ. I was talking to a woman of God yesterday, last week, and I said, look, everything that um, Billy Graham was going to places to preach, and he was not having enough results as he wanted, and God says, you are not preaching on the cross. Everything is the cross. The cross means submission. The cross means humility. The cross means everything we lose have been gained. And Paul said, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of Christ, for whom the world is crucified unto me, and I am also unto the world. Every time I preach a sermon, and that sermon has self-promotion, I said, oh, I'm this, I'm that, the first thing I get to when I get to my office is that the Lord says, you have preached yourself. That should not happen. Testify of me, not yourself. Separate yourself from those who cause divisions, tail bearers, gossip, slanderers. Maintain purity. The Bible says clearly that when there is no wood or fire, there's no contention. But a gossips separate many friends. Why tell me about the man? Why separate a man from his father or a man from his pastor? Separate yourself from those who will defraud you. You see, a greedy soul is always looking for shortcuts. Why not trust the Lord? When people are asking something from you, they are robbing you of something you have that they can never, you can never get elsewhere. Separate yourself from those who will cause you to dissipate your energy rather than focus your energy on what is right. I told them in the first service, between November and January, I have written a classical book. And that book has sold 1,000 copies in one meeting. I would have spent my time discussing about austerity and all kinds of things. I don't have time. You see me always, I carry a notebook. I can't tell you how many notebooks that have been finished. A notebook and a barrel. No time to talk about other people's success, except, except to just learn from them. I see one of the painful things I have, especially with young people. I've seen them say, oh, give me the anointing of this man. Give me the mantle of that person. If a like that man to come, now you won't you like it. You won't like it. And if it's really, you have a, 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 a larger mantle, you would have been arrested. Because a mantle for, a, a rebel for, for killed a lot of children. But now you've been in jail. You know, in those days when I was old, we used to pray, Lord, send another Elijah here. Lord, send another Elijah. But I think it's a, well, it's a childhood uh, immaturity. We don't need another Elijah here. Because there are no idols which you can put fire on. And rain is flowing freely. So don't go and collect mantles here and there. Don't go and be looking for handkerchiefs here and there. Don't go and be sitting in pastor chair when it's not there. Say, Lord, what is in that pastor? Come to me. Or carrying the shoe and put your leg there. Kabas, kabas, kabas. Since kabas is related to scatter, it will, it will be scattered. <laughs> Learn the principles that make people great. Not rob your, rob, go to look at their end. 
Every great man has a principle which he kept and brought him to greatness. And that's what you need to learn. And even a great man, if he doesn't continue to hold on to those principles that are brought him to greatness, he descends. Today, the richest man in the world, tomorrow the poorest man in the world. I thought that the richest man in the world is, um, is who is he? Um, a mosque. But he has been taken over. And just as people are very rich, that's how they get poor. So no man is your model. Learn the principles that made them what they are. Especially if that is your destiny in Christ. And our destiny are not the same. Don't be jealous of anybody. Ah, look at that person. He's that. What is that? I don't want to collect, collect information. That's why I don't go checking social media. Hey! Patrick, so, 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 he's not a chief. Where will I become a chief? When they put the crown of a chief in you, you will break your neck. I don't envy anyone. I don't look at anybody's example. I don't say, well, since God has done it for this man, he will do it for him. Why should he do it for me? I'm not interested in what God has done for him. A friend of mine one day was his deputy of a particular place. I thought he came to say, oh, God will soon lift you up to become the head of the party. I said, God will not lift me. I don't want it. It's what God gives me I want. Why should I be head of the department? Sometimes when people take positions in life, it limits their great, greatness. Chairman of company, when you become a chairman of a company, you lose, sometimes you lose your productivity. And the Bible says what? It said that, that, that fools are promoted to, to a particular level. And there's a thing called Peter Phenomena for those in management, that people rise up to the level of their incompetence. You are a good plumber, and they now make you CEO of a company. You can't do your plumbing again, and you're off. You are a good doctor, very skillful, and they make you put you to manager level, and you cannot even identify a hard sound or do any operation. So greatness is not in the positions you have. Greatness is your productivity. Let your what? Your profitability be known by all. And it's an everyday quest. Harry Potter, though I don't agree with most of her, 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 her novels, was an ordinary woman that slowly streamed up to Ryan Light through her novel and became a billionaire. Why not spend time in your track? Why not spend time in where God has called you? Nobody's dying. You can, even if you are 90, you can still make a, a change. Michelangelo, I think it was over 80 or so. When they ask him, what are you doing? He said, he's still working. So don't spend your time in comparing yourself and unhealthy competitiveness. Run away from those who will draw you back and destroy your destiny. Abraham knew that God wanted him to have a large heart. God wanted to have a large family. God wanted him to reach out to many people. Do you know those people are going to be great in this life? They're not those who keep their salaries in the bank and who guard their money. They're those who reach out to people, who touch lives. You know, they are the dockers in our midst. Because you never know when God is going to rain on you as a result of your kindness and your goodness. Abraham knew that God has called me to be a universal father of all men and not a territorial king of a place like Kenna or a place like whatever land they have there. He knew that God wanted him to look up and not to begin to settle squirrels. He knew that God wanted him to enlarge his heart because he knew that God is his strength. God is his succorer. God is the one that makes things happen for him. Look, the greatest lesson in my lifetime, two lessons recently. I was in Benin, autographing books. A woman came to me and said, please autograph my book for me. I said, I'm going to tell you one of the greatest lessons of my lifetime. I said, the great lessons of my lifetime is that God directs every moment of the Christian. Every moment of the Christian. I don't want to be self-directed. I don't want to be purpose directed. I want to be God directed. And then the other lesson I've learned of my life, which is one of the greatest lessons, that God is the source. 
And so I don't even look at anybody again. And I found out that God can use any instrument to make me better. You insult me, God will give me the capacity to resist and have residence. You bless me, the blessing you give to me is going to be my seed to do better. You ignore me, God will allow me to face the Lord Jesus Christ and forget you. You slander me, God will give me the grace to live up in such a way that your slandering will have no effect. So whatever you do to me, you are not important. I look up to the hills from whence Comment by help. Can we pray? <laughs> David says the stone which the builders refuse has become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. I'm going to take the first confession this morning. This confession is coming straight from my spirit. Raise up your right hand, everybody. Can you say, the stone with the builders refuse? Rise up. The stone with the builders refuse. It's become the headstone of the corner. Have they refused you visa? Have they refused you a job? Have they refused you promotion? Have men looked at you as not being successful? Are you a lady and nobody has proposed to you? A man, you can't get a spouse? Can you all say the stone with the builders refuse has become the headstone of the corner? Now I said, I am the stone the builders have refused. I am now the headstone of the corner. I am the stone with the builders refuse. I have become the headstone of the corner. I am the stone the builders refuse. I am now the headstone of the corner. God will make me a wonder. God will make me a miracle. God will make my life to outshine that of the people against me. My life will be marvelous in the eyes of everybody. Upon the left, I will be marvelous. Upon the right, I will be marvelous. Upon the south, I will be marvelous. Upon the east, I will be marvelous. The stone with the builders, if you hands, hands up, hands up. The stone with the builders refuse has become the headstone of the corner. In the name of the Saka Papaloska Kababaloshke, Rambaba Santa Paloshke Bobozaka Paloshke, I am become the headstone of the corner. Walk about and say, I become the headstone of the corner. I have become the headstone of the corner. Whatsoever my corner, I have become the headstone. 2023, I have become the headstone. I have become the headstone. I have become the headstone. It is marvelous in my eyes. I have become the headstone. I have become a surprise. I have become a miracle. I have become a wonder. I have become a wonder. I have become the headstone of the corner. In the name of Jesus. God bless me materially. God blesses me financially. God blesses me spiritually. God blesses me in my health. God blesses me in my family. I have become the headstone of the corner. I have become the headstone of the corner. I have become a testimony. A living testimony. I have become God's exhibit. I have become God's exhibit. Men will look at me and glorify my God in heaven. I have become the headstone of the corner. I have become the headstone of the corner. I have become the headstone of the corner. In the name of Jesus, I have become the headstone of the corner. In the name of Jesus, I have become the headstone of the corner. In the name of Jesus, I have become the headstone of the corner. Now speak to the Lord in one minute. Speak to him in one minute. While we are praying, if you are here and you don't know Christ, you've not received him as your personal savior, I want to say, Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord and savior. Or you gave your life to Christ. And then you took it up again. I want to say, Pastor, I want to come back to Christ. If you're in that situation, can you begin to come to this stage now? You backslided. Or you're not filled with the Holy Ghost. I want to get the Spirit of Jesus. I said, Pastor, look, I want to change right now. Beginning from today. I want to be a child of God. Watching me online. 
You want to change and say, I want to be a child of God. I want to be a child of God. In the name of Jesus. I want to be a child of God. Whatever you are, say, God, forgive me my sins. Cleanse me from all my iniquity. Reach out to me. Reach out to me. Your two hands up, I have become a wonder. I have become a wonder in the streets. I have become a wonder in my home. I have become a wonder in my school. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Lord, as we come to this Holy Communion. Hallelujah. Let's clap for the Lord Jesus. 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 Let's do it massively. Let's clap for the Lord Jesus. Let's clap for the Lord Jesus. Let's do it massively. Let's clap for the Lord Jesus. Let's clap for the Lord Jesus. Let's do it massively. Roma masaka papaloshki momosaka paloshki. Now I'm going to pray a particular prayer today. Hebrews 11.10 Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations. A city designed and built by God. I pity you if you're always talking about your past. Hey, I would have been the I would have been this person, if not this. And many men were proposing to me, why did I go for this? I would have liked money. And I pity you. Because what is ahead of you cannot be compared to what you are now. You know, King Turkey Chicken, all of you will go out of the country, all of you here now, you will get there, you will get there. You will be scattered around the world. I have seen that vision. And when you go, ask for King Turkey Chicken. Don't take it off for nobody. Don't take it for that for the force or twice. The man established it at the age of 65. And you are dismissing your life at 40. Dismissing your life at 50. Dismissing your life at 60. Say, if not now, I would have been something. What is something? How old was Abraham when God called him? When did Moses launch out? Age what? 120 years old. 40 he started. 80 he was useless. Until he was 120. I repeat again. Abraham was confidently looking forward. Everybody say, I am confidently looking forward. From that, I am confidently looking forward. I am confidently looking forward. That my children will be good. That my, my life will be better. That my finances will do well. That my health will progress. That whatsoever I have lost, I will get it. I am confidently looking forward. I am confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations. A city designed and built by God. All right, let's go take it, this confession three times. One. I am confidently looking forward, everybody, to a city with eternal foundations. A city designed and built by God. Now, all Nigerians here, did you see a Milokon here? Did you see obedient movement? Did you see PDP here? Did you see that? No! Because God didn't even know they exist. They're just passing through. They are passengers. Because that is not an eternal foundation. Let's go through it again. I am confidently looking, everybody, to a city with eternal foundation. A city designed and built by God. Now put your hand on your head. I knock out every thought. I knock out every imagination 
I knock at every suggestion that will keep me buried in my past. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I knock at every thought. I knock at every imagination. I knock at every high thing that will keep me in my past. I bind you and I cast you out in the name of Jesus. I knock down every thought and every imagination that will keep me in my past. I knock it down in the name of Jesus. I am confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundation. A city designed and built by God. One more time, I am confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations. A city designed and built by God. Now if you have a building plan, raise up your hands. Every one of us has a building plan. Plan to live out. Plan to do. Say, raise up your hand and say, now I'm building now. And I'm finishing this building. I'm building my life. I'm finishing this, this building. In the name of Jesus. Receive it in the name of Jesus. I stand in authority by the power of the Holy Ghost. And I pray you are going to move forward in the name of Jesus. This is your year of bountiful harvest. This is your year of enlargement. You have moved from prayer to prevailing. From crying to being a champion. From suggestion to be a winner. From introspection to be an expression. In the name of Jesus, you take over the city. You take over the nation. You take over the world. Your spiritual foundation is solid. In Jesus' name we pray. Father, as we come to the Holy Communion, I pray you will bless this bread. I pray you will bless this wine. That everybody that takes it will partake of the body and of the blood of Jesus. Lord, if there be anyone here who is not a right with you, that by reason of this invitation, they will come to the knowledge of Christ. I bless this bread. I bless this one. Take it in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Be seated.